Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk again to Imam Tom. Welcome back, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa Paul. It's been a while. It's really good that we're back together again, uh, producing yeah. things together. A lot, a lot's been happening, of course, and you've been extremely busy. As, as uh, you can, we can see you on giving lectures on uh, Instagram and TikTok, and uh, you've been extremely busy given what's going on in the world. We'll come back to that in a minute, perhaps. Um, just a brief intro to those who don't know. Uh, Imam Tom uh, Fukini uh, converted to Islam in 2010. A year before, he finished his BA in political science from Vassar College. He studied at the Islamic University of Medina uh, from 2015 to 2020, where he obtained his BA from the Faculty of Sharia. Imam Tom is currently the research director of Islam and Society at the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. Uh, he is special advisor to the Utica Masjid in Utica in New York. He also teaches tafsir and Islamic history online through Legacy International Online High School. Um, and as you might know, um, Imam Tom has kindly agreed to discuss the books that have made a significant difference to him intellectually. And today he will uh, discuss criticism of the impossible state. Now, this is a book we've been through. I think we've done five uh, videos, uh, more or less, uh, on the impossible state. Um, but today also we'll be looking at part one of another book, Restating Orientalism, a critique of modern knowledge. Both books are by Wal Halak and published by Columbia University Press. And this is the, the new book we're looking at, uh, Restating Orientalism, there you go, a critique of modern knowledge. It's quite a big tome, um, Columbia University Press in New York. Um, for those who don't know, um, Halak is professor in the humanities at Columbia University in the States, where he's been teaching ethics, law, and political thought since 2009. He's considered a leading scholar in the field of Islamic legal studies and has been described as one of the world's leading authorities on Islamic law. So, uh, Imam Tom, over to you, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen, nabiyyina wa khudu wa salam, Muhammad alayhi wa khudu salah, wa azka taslim, Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'una bima alamtana wa zinna alimna ya rabbil alameen. Thank you very much for the opportunity, as always, Paul, to come on and, and talk about um, what really matters. Uh, honestly, we're not just doing this to go through books. Uh, I rate Restating Orientalism is one of the most, if not the most important book of the last 70 to 100 years in the English language. Wow. Um, that's my personal opinion. Um, the things that it puts into place, that questions that it answers, and that's not to say that it even understands itself. Halak would not say that this is a completed project. He actually says in the preface and in the intro that this is the latest installment of his project and there's more work to do. But um, the way that it shifts the terrain um, is absolutely essential and absolutely essential to the moment in which we're living. You know, it's no accident that we're coming together here on uh, December 26, 2023. Um, as soon as things continued uh, or as soon as things began to escalate in Gaza, the bombardment, the massacre, the genocide in Gaza, it was not very long uh, before I started realizing that we need to talk about this book. Um, even though because of professional duties and because of, you know, personal circumstances and also just sort of the difficulty of watching, you know, uh, the massacres being essentially live streamed, mm -hmm. um, that took some time to, uh, acclimate to, um, not that we have acclimated or we want to acclimate, but, but to get to a level where we're functional again, where we're able to talk about things, I still knew that it would be very essential to talk about this book. Um, because Halak seeks to answer the question, well, I'll say this first, that many people have observed and they have drawn a, delect, a direct line between the genocide that is going on in Gaza and previous European genocides that have happened in the Americas, for example. They have drawn a direct line and there is a direct resemblance. It is the same nuclear family, siblings, sibling massacres uh, of the settler colonialism that Set, quote unquote settled and conquered and subjugated the Americas to the settler colonialism that the Zionist entity of Israel has practiced in Palestine. There is a direct line, there's a direct logical similitude. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the big questions that has animated my academic career since my undergrad at Vassar 
um, and one that Halak grapples with and answers in the most convincing way that I have ever seen is why this violence? Why does it come about? Is it unique? And what is responsible for it? We will get into different criticisms of his work. Uh, we've talked about some of these criticisms in the past, the idea that, oh, um, you know, anybody would have done this if they had the technological means. Anybody would have done this if they had the material. So there's a materialist rendering of history, what Halak calls a material, materialist rendering of history. Anyone would have done this, whether it was China or the Muslims or etc. And Halak not only emphatically rejects this, but he completely demolishes the possibility that that is true by tying the structure of genocide and violence and settler colonialism to the very constitution of self, understanding of self, and the regime of knowledge, which is why the subtitle of his book, right, the, the he actually said, and I was fortunate enough to, I, I always take the jacket covers off of my books, I can't stand them. So do I actually when I read them. <laughs> you can read his A Critique of Modern Knowledge. Yeah. Yes, exactly. A Critique of Modern Knowledge. Um, he And I was able to, you know, I had this in my mind. I was invited to, everything happens for a reason, Paul, it's amazing. You know, I was invited to Georgetown University uh, to give a talk and then it was canceled because of my strident criticism of the Zionist entity. And then- really? and, and Georgetown yeah. University of all places, which has a, has a good reputation in terms of Islamic studies and so on. And, True, wow. but they have, they have, impl they, so they have a deep implication with the security state and sort of the security apparatus within the United States. And so there was some concerns. Anyway, I don't mean to, I don't want to rehash that. We've, we've been there, done that. But what I'm trying to point out is that everything happens for a reason, because in the wake of that, the students at Columbia University uh, noticed that and they invited me. And when they invited me, I started talking to the students and asking how to get in touch with Professor Halak. That uh, resulted in a three hour lunch meeting where I, wow. I, went, to, I went to Harlem, we sat down together uh, and we talked, I talked about, we talked about the criticisms of his work. We talked about, um, Specifically, I told him that we would be doing this video series on on restating Orientalism. I asked for some clarification on some points and things like that. Um, so I was able to benefit from from him directly, and he's very much in support of of your work, Paul, and and our work here together. Um, so um, with that being said, so so we have to understand how. Okay, so restating Orientalism was written in 2018. Okay, and the previous book that we explained. Uh, the Impossible State was written in 2013. So The Impossible State sent shockwaves through Western Academy. It was a very, very popular book. Um, it became the it book, right? It was one of the few sort of, um, you know, Halak as an individual has really revolutionized Islamic studies as a field in the West. I think wow. that can't be uh, underestimated. Uh, yeah. If you look at even the critiques of his work by say, such as the likes of Muhammad Fadl, uh, who I'll talk about a critique of his earlier work in a second. Um, he praises Halak before he wrote The Impossible State as changing the field, the entire field of, of uh, Islamic studies and replacing the canonical texts um, that used to be taught, even though they were understood as problematic, such as the ones of Schacht and et cetera and company, um, uh, basically essentially replacing uh, the previous canon. And if I can just grab my camera for a second here and illustrate to you all, um, sort of the this is all halak. Um, um, so wow. you, have, you know the origins and evolution of Islamic law, an introduction to Islamic law, a history of Islamic legal theories, Sharia transformations, impossible state, and restating Orientalism. This is a veritable syllabus, right? Yes, he exactly. has. Um, he has completely revolutionized the field and taken it. Um, I think he's done for Islamic studies, what Paul al-Assad did for anthropology, in the sense that he is forcing it to grapple and reckon with its colonial past, not just in terms of the projects of political domination that it is it was contemporary with, but mm -hmm. also the structures of knowledge that led to that political domination. Um, so his- so what we're so I do want to mention, I, I would say, to, of course, which is part of the, ca the canonical text as well, uh, Orientalism. Uh, and uh, I, I would say, uh, sorry, Halak says in his intro, I think he's not he's not seeking to refute this. He's simply to build on it, deepen it, uh, look at a, a more theoretical foundational level, mm -hmm. whereas it's more concerned with texts, uh, quoting 
uh, texts, Orientalist, uh, from Orientalist work. So th th this also is uh, an iconic text, Orientalism by um, uh, Edward W. Said as well. Yes, and we'll definitely get heavily into the relationship between Halak yeah. and Said's work. Um, yeah. Halak stands on Said's shoulders, but as he also says elsewhere, um, the dependence upon his work is, is more psychological um, and him as a figure and what he represents is more psychological than it is necessarily substantive. Uh, Halak compares himself to taking Saeed's ship and hijacking it and taking it to a better destination, um, yeah. which will all come in due time. But to, to give the, the viewer the understanding of the significance of Halak in his field and his works in his field, and the attention that his work has has uh, has garnered, um, not all of it positive. You can imagine anybody who attempts to sort of revolutionize or deconstruct, as it were, uh, a field is going to attract both positive and negative attention. And so I wanted to give a rundown uh, quickly of some critiques of Halak's work up and through the writing of The Impossible State. Um, which basically the critiques go right before uh, the writing of Restating Orientalism. And Restating Orientalism is a very satisfying response to many of the valid critiques. I decided to do this because he himself, Halak, does this in the intro for Said's works, right? For Orientalism, he runs down, I think, he does a typology of the types of critiques that uh, Orientalism and Said's works, uh, uh, sort of people, their responses to his work, and he separates them into those that are legitimate and those that are not legitimate, because not every critique is valid. There are some critiques that are valid. Yeah, you then, say some are very, very uh, overly political. In other words, they yes, kind of exactly because it, it, the critique of, of Zionism, for example, that was then used to condemn him. Uh, well, it has a political objection. It's not a, a substantive one academically. I mean, yeah, exactly. And that's something that I'd like to bring attention to now. And many people ask me all the time, Tom, why don't you have a PhD, and and or why didn't you go further? And and you know. I confess that I, I have a certain loathing for the academy um, that I think I share actually with Professor Halak, and we talked about that in person. And I'm suspicious of um, the the I'm suspicious of the Western Academy in very very fundamental ways, and I have um, uh, I have severe uh, hesitancy to allow myself to be constituted by the forces that work on on people in those spaces. That's not to say that it's totalizing. Uh, there are people who escape it, but it's a very um, it's a very treacherous endeavor. And I, why I'm bringing this up now is because just as people who critiqued Said's work, some of those critiques were merely excuses and facades to discredit that work. Some yeah. of the critiques of Halak's work, though he's too humble to say it, are similar. Some of the critiques of Halak's work are mere facades. They are politically motivated. They are excuses, even jealousy at times, to be frank, um, to discredit his work. That's not to say all critiques are. There are some fruitful critiques. There are critiques that further um, you know, someone's work and someone's thinking. But I want the person who is viewing and listening to be able to think about that when we're running through the different types of critique, that some critiques are made from an emotional place, uh, from a place of jealousy or an attempt to legitimize, but really there's not much to it. And these are the first type, if I'm going to offer a typology of critique for Halak's work, I would say the first fall into this category, what I call the gotcha critiques, right? They are sort of these um, edifices and these devices that people invent that they think that the critique is fairly profound when in fact uh, it is not, or at least it stands on some philosophical premises that have not yet been interrogated. For example, um, there are sort of these dismissals of Halak's work as being essentialist, right? This is a very, very common critique. It's one that anybody who goes through undergrad learns very quickly through osmosis to dismiss something as essentialist. Yeah. But the vast, vast majority of the time, nobody could even justify that why that would be a problem that anything would be essentialist in the first place or what they mean when they're saying that a particular work is essentialist or that Halak's rendering of the Sharia is essentialist. Is the person who's who's waging this critique implying that nothing has any essence at all? Is that an existentialist critique? Most people aren't haven't thought that far. Or are they saying that the essence that Halak has described of the Sharia is a misrepresentation, right? To which degree is it a misrepresentation? Um, are there sim are there simply um, 
uh, what we would say exceptions to the rule. Is he pointing out the rule of the day and there are some exceptions? Um, and do the presence of exceptions invalidate the rule and the general thrust of what Halak is pointing out? Halak does a great job in uh, restating Orientalism in accounting for this type of critique with what he calls central domains and peripheral domains. We won't touch it today, even though it is in the intro because he comes back around later in the book to go through it. But he does a really good job of demonstrating um, that it, it it is not necessarily the critique you think it is to say that, oh, he has an essentialist rendering of, of the Sharia. So I always, I mean, as a layman, uh, as a non, I get, when I, when I read that critique of the, uh, of the essentialism labeled against him, I always thought it was very strange from my point of view because there is such a thing as normative Islam in the Sin tradition. We have the four yes. swords, the four <laughs> matabs, we, we and, and the, the, these these do give uh, domains, as I like might call them, or kind of paradigms of all the, or, or parameters about what is and what isn't acceptable. You just can't jump into the Sharia and make up your own thing. You've got to be qualified. You've got to work within tradition. You've got to work within the school. So there is a normativity to Islam. Fantastic. And if, if, if that's essentialism, well, so be it. That That is a yes. positive normativity. Otherwise, Islam becomes anarchic. It becomes deconstructed and collapses under this kind of postmodern chaos. And so I, I always found that kind of accusation rather irrelevant actually and 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 how can, how, how can a, a person seriously offer that as a criticism yes well done well done you hit the nail on the head there when it comes to some people who when they mean that when they say it's an essential that this is essentialist and they mean it in a pejorative or a derogatory way what they are not stating is that they do not think that islam has any essence or they do not think that the sharia has any essence and this is obviously an un-islamic take and we would accuse them of some sort of intellectual colonialism because we have an essence and we believe that Islam has an essence and the Sharia has an essence. And here you are as some sort of usually non-Muslim or nominally Muslim scholar telling us that the Sharia and Islam does not have an essence. Who are you? Who are you to wage that charge, right? You have in fact sort of allowed yourself to be colonized by a certain philosophy that rejects essences in total or thinks that this leads to some sort of paradigmatic violence or something like that, which we'll get into. Um, but it's not much of a critique nor is it much of a critique to call something to say that it's merely a monolith, right? This is another sort of thing. Maybe we could say the opposite half or the, the other side of the coin of the essentialist argument or critique is to say that, well, he presents the Sharia as a monolith or he presents this as, as a monolith and it's not a monolith. Everybody knows nothing's a monolith. This is not a, a serious critique. Again, we're talking, and this is where his idea of central and peripheral domains are going to come in very handy where the exceptions do not negate the existence of rules. Yes. The exceptions do not negate the existence of a general thrust of things, of a certain structure of things, right? Um, he'll get into that very, you know, in, in fine detail, and, and we don't need to necessarily get into it now. But I would not consider these serious critiques. Sorry, you, you want to say comment? No, no, no I, I completely agree, actually. That was my... Uh... I mean, it's amazing that some of these critiques strike me as, you know, if, if they were, if I could be some trivial for a second, if these were actually expounded, say, at Speaker's Corner in London, you know, uh, they would be shot down instantly. Uh, you know, they're, they're actually not very substantive at all. And yet they're dressed up as uh, uh, as, as great intellectual critiques, but they're yes. not real. Not all of them. Anyway. Much, much of critique, unfortunately, is posturing. And that's why we need to be able to, set, to, to differentiate between legitimate critique and the substance of a critique versus the mere posturing and sort of the facades yeah. and edifices uh, that people put up in order to just simply dismiss something or delegitimize something. Yeah. Um, one of the more substantial critiques that's out there of Halak's work, and it is specifically of the impossible state, was by Professor Andrew March, who's a political theory professor at, now I believe he's at um, UMass Amherst, um, someone who I met uh, in Istanbul at the uh, UMATX conference, and I, I, I respect his He's a very charitable interlocutor and a very uh, a very sharp mind. Um, even if we have deep disagreements, I mean, he's a liberal and and I believe an atheist, um, but he um, is more fair than a lot of people when it comes to uh, critique. And he his critiques tend to be more generative and productive. Like he he often uh, provides like almost like research questions, further things to think about uh, that or that need to be clarified. And I appreciate that about him very much. He has a couple um, things that were part of his critique that he wrote in 2014, a year after The Impossible State was written. Um, he talks about, there, there are some that are more valid than others. This entire thing I'm going in ascending order from I think the least legitimate critiques to maybe the more legitimate critiques 
um, or the ones that at least uh, seem more legitimate. Um, he brings up his concern about pluralism within Sharia, um, and that's very typical for a, a liberal Rawlsian to do. However, I think I would be interested in asking him after restating Orientalism, I think Halak makes the case that um, that the Sharia society is much more accommodating of pluralism and true pluralism than Western society, which is much more, you know, especially the nation state, which is much more totalitarian and yeah. totalizing. Um, uh, he also brings up, he, he kind of says that Halak's account of the past is somewhat mythical, um, you know, meaning that it's, it, this is sort of an empirical critique, that it's not necessarily adhering, you know, the, the, the theoretics of what he's sort of saying was the pre-modern Sharia society is not necessarily borne out by the facts. Now, I'd point to two things here. I'd point, first of all, to, again, the distinction that Halak makes between central and peripheral domains. Um, as, you know, again, not every exception invalidates the rule. In fact, most don't, um, which he had not articulated in the impossible state, but he doesn't articulate in restating Orientalism. So if I had to sit down with Professor Andrew March, I would like to ask his opinion about that, um, seeing that I think that Halak addressed sort of the idea of the mythical past. And a second point that addresses it is that, well, that's precisely the point when it comes to the structure of knowledge and Halak is most concerned about the structures of knowledge here is that, you know, it's a very modern definition of history where fact is separated from value, where we are merely concerned with history being factually what took place. Whereas the Greek rendering of history and the pre-modern rendering of history is the idea of we are trying to build a capacity for moral action, that we are trying to tell a hero's tale in which we are creating the ability for somebody to move forward and act virtuously in the world. So even if he were correct, even if Professor March was correct that Halak's uh, account of pre-modern Islamic pasts was somewhat mythical, we could say, so what? Maybe that's actually the point, that it is mythical in the sense that it is creating the capacity for a moral action. Halak has recollapsed the, the difference and the space and the rupture between fact and value um, and between is and ought uh, that he set out to do. So that would be a consistency and not something necessarily held against him. Mm. The final thing, and this is, I think, something that is maybe the more productive critique that comes out of uh, Professor March that I, that I myself am interested in developing further, is what he locates as the difference between siyasa and sharia, or siyasa and fiqh. So he rightly says, and Halak wouldn't deny this either, that we're talking about the Sharia society, okay, and that this is a certain paradigmatic society. There was also the something that within the Sharia was recognized as siyasa, which is basically the discretionary um, arena of sultans and governments to even make some sort of administrative legislations or legislation or be able to enforce things. They basically had discretion. So he wanted to see a more robust sort of discussion of the difference between these two spheres and how the Sharia society structures the latter, the Siyasa sort of uh, arena. That's really interesting. And I think that does need to be uh, developed further. But I think that also Halak does develop it further in restating Orientalism. But I think that it could even be further developed still. Um, Halak is working on another book right now that I'm really excited about, where yeah. he deals with al Mawadi's um, Adab al-Dunya wa or Adab al-Din wa dunya um, I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen from that. But it is something really interesting. The next sort of typology of critique is one that's very curious and puzzling to me that I don't understand, honestly. And, and that's what I, I call the Islamist or uh, Khalifist critique, such as that's come from uh, Hizb tahrir and others. Their website, khalifa.com. They, they, they publish quite savage criticisms of Halak's work, a possible state, I mean. I'm not really yes. Uh, savage and misplaced, unfortunately. Um, that that I, I don't care if someone's critique is savage if they've demonstrated that they've understood the work. But uh, I, I'm really honestly puzzled by by this line of critique, which basically says that Halak uh, is anti-caliphate and leaves us no solutions, and this is defeatist and it sets us back or leaves it in a leaves us in a hole. Um, I don't understand how someone can read the impossible state and 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 get that. I don't think that. I think that this is a case of a little bit of a, too sensitive of a censor and too sensitive of a reaction to anything that would seem to be critical of previous methods of Islamic political organizing. 
which Halak forces groups like HT and Islamists, and I hate that term, Islamists, yeah. um, because it's part it's of the, uh, yeah, it's part of the Orientalist repertoire to yes. demonize the, the anything beyond the purely pietistic expression yes. of faith in the political dom in domain, because Islam encompasses all domains. So exactly. The, the idea in the category of Islamism is completely false and a, and a result of the securitization of Muslims and Islam because every Muslim that is properly calibrated and constituted is an Islamist in the sense that all of us believe that sh the Sharia is the best law for mankind and yeah. should reign supreme. Now, when... Um, the the analogy here, if, uh, sorry, uh, uh, perhaps a slightly off the subject analogy here. Uh, some people say to me, Paul, are you a, are you a creationist? You see, I, I do these no design posts, and I'm saying, well, of course I'm a creationist. Um, everyone is a cre every, everyone who all Jews, you know, Orthodox Jews, Christians, and Muslims are creationists because we believe the universe is created by God. But the term <laughs> has has been distorted as as if you're anti-science or in, in favor, of particularly I don't know, young Earth. Uh, young age of the of the earth creation or something, which I'm not what I meant, but we're all literally creationists because we believe in a creator. In the same way, we all every as you put it, properly constituted Muslim is an Islamist because Islam encompasses life, the deen, everything. So it's like a redundant right. criticism. You're saying, yes. well, are you a, are you a Muslim Muslim or are you a, yes. are you one of those Muslims that believe in the creator? Yes, yeah. that's what Muslims do. We believe in the creator. Of the the other, the other of the Islamist or the opposite of the Islamist is the secular Muslim, and that's yeah. really what it is. So yeah. you know, when when people invent that bifurcation, they are attempting to secularize Islam and secularize the Muslims by exactly what you said, turning Islam into a private, quietist, apolitical faith, which it is not. Now, if I were Abdul, Dr. Abdul Wahid uh, on Piers Morgan, and Piers Morgan asked me if I wanted Sharia to rule. UK, I would have said unequivocally, yes, 100%. But it doesn't mean what you think it means, because people like yeah. Piers Morgan think from their Christian European trauma, think yeah. that, a, that means that we're going to start swinging swords and forcing things on people. That is the history. I saw that and I winced for poor, uh, uh, after, I, I, I sympathize with him because it was a trap. Because yes. if you say you definitely believe a tree, ah, oh, you want to see stoning and hand chopping in right. the UK. So exactly. the question is not really as it sounds. It, it, it's importing a certain uh, trope about uh, the Sharia, and that's what he's been asked to endorse. But yes. of course, the, the Muslim wasn't actually endorsing. That's not real. That's not what Sharia is. It's something. Yes, but here's different. Morgan should be challenged. If I'm able to convince 51 percent of the people in the UK that the Sharia is the best way, and they all vote for the Sharia, what are you going to do about it, Piers? Are you going to stop <laughs> Sharia? How far does your commitment to democracy really go? Or are you really committed to something else that's not democracy? Are you cre are you committed to something that is more like secular liberalism at the expense of democracy? You would jump off the ship of democracy if the people of the UK, I convinced all of them, which I think in time we will, <laughs> that, <laughs> that the Sharia is a supreme and superior model of governing people uh, than whatever you've got now that enables and facilitates and arms a genocide and refuses to stop a genocide in Gaza and Palestine. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Uh, getting off topic here. So I reject the I reject the the category of Islamism. It's 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 ridiculous, and I also reject Islamophobia. But it is Islamophobic in the sense that people mean it. Um, however, this type of critique is very very curious, and I I really encourage the people who have this critique to spend more time with the text and familiarize themselves more with Halak's work, and especially to read Restating Orientalism. He, explic he explicitly says, Halak, he says that Restating Orientalism is a sequel to The Impossible State. The Impossible State is uh, aimed at the Muslim self to delineate possibilities and impossibilities, whereas Restating Orientalism is aimed at the Western self. Um, it doesn't take a rocket science to take Halak's critiques and reverse engineer things. And we'll talk about that as we, as we get further into the book, that to the contrary of this type of critique, Halak leaves us with very obvious things to do right now. If you are somebody who champions for a, 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 a caliphate uh, or a khilafah, which many people do, myself included, right? It's like it leaves us with very tangible steps. It does not abandon us at slogans. 
uh, which unfortunately a lot of people calling for the caliphate do. They leave us only with slogans and they don't get into the nitty gritty details of how are we going to, uh, how are we going to establish economic dependence, how, independence? How are we going to establish political independence? How are we going to establish power and build power? How are we going to correct our ways of knowing and our categories of understanding that will prevent the type of violence and secularization that is now hegemonic across the world. Halak forces you to deal with all of this. And so I'm afraid that some of the people who are uh, who felt triggered by Halak's critiques are triggered by getting into the nitty gritty details of this thing that we're moving. Halak forces us to move past slogans and he forces us to get into the details of what is the way forward? How do we actually realize these goals? Um, and he does so, I think, in a way that, as I said, leaves a very, very clear path for action. The third um, and final typology of critique that I'll deal with is what I call the realist critique. Um, this is spearheaded by folks such like Muhammad Fadl, who wrote uh, a critique of an earlier work of, uh, of Halak in, in 2011. So that was, I think, uh, a critique of his Sharia transformations, which, you know, Halak doesn't necessarily say that uh, all of his work is cumulative. It is, but it's all part of the same project, right? So if you go back to the earlier works of Halak, an introduction to Islamic law, or the origins and evolution of Islamic law, to restating Orientalism, it's all part of the same project. You see how some of his ideas are refined, some of his like arguments change, some of them are very, very consistent throughout. Um, so Father, he critiques He's yeah. a professor of, of law, by the way, at University of Toronto in Canada. Yes. He had a privilege of meeting earlier this year. Yeah. Yes, and he was also at the Omatix Conference in, in Toronto, uh, in uh, Istanbul, last year, and I was able to meet him as well. Uh, I'm also in some WhatsApp groups with him. So some of my sense of his critique is also gleaned from discussions that happen in these WhatsApp groups, not just his, his critique, his formal critique that he published. Um, so there's a, couple, there's a couple of critiques in the realist camp. Um, some of them more legitimate than others. The, the less legitimate ones is that the idea of modernity, right? Um, how should I go with this? Okay, I'll deal with this one first. The idea that it's a similar to the gotcha critique that we mentioned earlier, that you're just doing the same thing that the Orientalists did. You just reversed it. So the Orientalists say that Islam is uh, bad because it is backwards and whatever, and it's not modern and it can't fit into modernity, right? It, and so therefore it's bad. So part of the realist critique is saying, well, you know, you're saying that Islam can't fit into modernity, but you're just saying that it's good. So really, you have the same critique of the Orientalists or you have the same sort of understanding of things as the Orientalists do. Now, Halak does a great job in restating Orientalism. That's, I think, partly why he used Orientalism as the heuristic to expose this critique, critique by showing how that is a very surface level similarity because you understand the structure of Orientalism and what Orientalism represents for the structure of Western knowledge as a whole. And to say that Islam doesn't fit into this is not necessarily, it, it doesn't necessarily follow that that understanding of Islam is the same or the product of the same structure of knowledge to say that it doesn't fit in with this particular thing. And that will become clearer as we merrily row along. Um, it also, this type of critique, I think it has a certain unstated bias towards synthesis, right? So if we're saying that there's a thesis and then antithesis and then synthesis, it wants everything to be a dialectic. And that doesn't seem to me to be self-evidently true. There are certain things that must be rejected. If we talk about, uh, and this I think is even a metaphysical position, if we talk about shirk and tawheed, okay? Are we to say that there is supposed to be some synthesis between shirk and tawhid? That, okay, that uh, now there was shirk and so now the antithesis of, of, of shirk is tawhid and really the most productive and closer to the truth thing is to make a synthesis between the two? No, there needs to be an evaluation and an assessment of when a dialectic is, is appropriate and when a dialectic is not appropriate. When a synthesis is something that is to be sought after and when a synthesis is actually not something to be sought after at all. You know, if you had poison and you had honey, you would not want a synthesis between the poison and the honey. That would still kill you, right? So there needs to be some 
further clarification between these types of things. I think there's a bias towards synthesis and dialectics that people well, look and they say. The Hegel, obviously, in the 19th century, and his influence is still on European thought. You know, the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is there. It's, it's a European um, yes. argument, and it's not you know universal. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. It's like it's a, it can be a tool in a toolbox, but for the person who only has a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And yeah. what we're trying to say is that not everything's a nail, and you can't use a hammer to saw a board in half, right? So you know there needs to be some differentiation of tactics here, and it's not self-evident to me that that is a valid critique. Um, <clears throat> and it will become clear as as we we keep on going. Um, that one I, I sort of already addressed. The the last and I think maybe perhaps most important critique to deal with out of all these critiques, it comes from the realist camp, which is the idea that the only thing that is holding Muslims back is just that we don't have enough bombs and aircraft and weaponry and et cetera, et cetera. That you guys in your theory and your, you know, you, you, you Foucault lovers, you guys are just getting lost in the plot. This is about real politic, right? Um, about, you know, it's just about producing more factories, industrialization, uh, modernization of economy. We have to modernize in order to produce the capacity to fight the, the, the forces of, of colonization, to get military independence so we don't have to buy from the U.S. or the U.K., et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are some important things of that critique that need to be dealt with, and we'll get to that in a second. But the weakness of this critique is that there is the possibility that you can save Muslims by losing Islam at the same time. And that is, I think, Halak's ultimate critique of that critique or response to that critique is that if you drop everything and adopt modernization on the Western model for what it is, then you will lose Islam you will lose exactly what made Islam different in the first place to this particular type of modernity. Now, there remains the problem of how to develop power and military capacity. There remains the problem of, okay, is it possible to have a wartime economy that is not, uh, doesn't engage in the same totalizing sort of subject formation that Halak rightly sort of uh, points out and, and blames, right? But the fact of the matter is, Modernity is built for violence. Modernity is violent, okay, in its very structures of knowledge and everything that is produced from those structures of knowledge, genocide, settler colonialism, racism, the nation state, all these sorts of things. It's not a praiseworthy characteristic to be the most efficient and ruthless and bloodthirsty. Yet that is the metric by which the modern world is succeeding. It is failing by every single other. To give one extreme example of, of that, one of the uh, the nations in Europe that was most hot on technology and and advancement in t in terms of recreating the world in a very efficient way was was Nazi Germany, of course. A huge emphasis on developing uh, white hot technology in the service of the the German race, but of course, uh, no, no one's holding no one's holding that up today as, as a model for anything. Um, so yeah, and this is this moral uh, component uh, and morality, of course, is rooted in transcendent values, not just on ephemeral uh, liberal values which have no metaphysical foundation at all, uh, and they deliberately don't. Unless there's this moral component, then um, all, all our attempts at uh, uh, technological advancement will collapse in the same way that Western modernity has collapsed in, in you know uh, in the ways we're seeing as we speak now. Well done. Yes, and there, so there is a, a an implicit materialism in this critique uh, that needs to be taken seriously, and a denial of some of the non-material, metaphysical components of reality that are essential, structural, um, and inseparable from our deen. Now, that doesn't mean, and this is, I think, if I'm circling areas that need to be built out and theorized out and thought out, that doesn't mean that the problem isn't correct like that there is an asymmetry of military power there though that i think life after october 7th have shown that that might be less significant than people initially thought um that there needs to be something in the way of military independence where people are not just you know they're they can't do anything they're compromised because all of their 
uh, weapons contracts and defense contracts come from the West. There, this needs to be thought through very carefully and thoroughly. However, what we're critiquing here is the diagnosis, or no, excuse me, we're not critiquing necessarily the diagnosis, we're critiquing the prescription. Whereas the prescription is to throw ourselves headlong into the modernity that the West has pioneered would be to jeopardize Islam in the most serious and structural way. Um, so that essentially runs down most of the critiques that I'm aware of that are worth mentioning when it comes to Halak and his works in the impossible up through the impossible state. And it's significant because restating Orientalism, I think, deals with all of these critiques in very, very convincing ways. Um, today we're going to handle uh, through no sort of just, just this is what I got through, the preface and the intro. There are certain things that uh, I'm not, I'm going to skip over in the intro that are going to come back around later uh, and we'll sort of double back to sort of not repeat ourselves. Um, Halak said in our, our personal meeting that the subtitle is the real title of the book, right? Is that restating Orientalism Orientalism is merely a heuristic. It's merely something that we're using to demonstrate something else, okay? That the real meat of the book or the point of the book is a critique of modern knowledge. And the idea that modern knowledge, the way of knowing itself, leads to or even is genocide. It is responsible for colonialism. It is responsible for the atrocities that we see. Not technology, not material supremacy, not guns, germs, and steel, they happen to be on an east-west axis and all this sort of thing. No, that the, why European colonialism happened the way it did was because of the knowledge structure, because of the knowledge of modernity, right? It was like, if you imagine a bow, you're pulling back your bow and you're letting it go. We're getting right back to the very point at which where it lands, the very, very, all the way back into the ways of knowing. There is something about Oh, the, the modern way of knowing, hint, hint, as he talked about it in Impossible State, the separation of fact and value, the separation of is and ought, the, the sidelining and marginalization of morality from knowledge in and of itself, that caused all these subsequent change, changes down the line. However, that being said, that even though the, you know, Halak said, you know, that the, the, the big title, Restating Orientalism, was almost incidental. I would say that's too too humble of him, that it's actually very, very significant that he chose Orientalism um, as the title and as his heuristic. If he used a different heuristic, it would not have been nearly as powerful. Um, and if he used a different entry point, even though it's true that Orientalism is merely an entry point through which, once we go th through it, you will see the entire structure of modern knowledge and why it's so sick. He calls it a psychoepistemic disease or a psycho psychoepistemic disorder, I believe is the word that he uses. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, it's quite an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Orientalism is just the hole in the wall that we're going to crawl into. However, I say that it's the most important hole that we could have po possibly crawled in through um, for reasons. Okay. Why? Why is Orientalism a particularly important? Uh, heuristic or a hole through which we enter into this matrix. First, because it touches, and this is Halak's words, every important aspect of modernity. Okay, Orientalism touches on every important as aspect of modernity. There are other parts of modernity that are not so essential that are not even necessarily important to bring up uh, for our purposes. But Orientalism itself it has a certain uncanny, it's a microcosm. The second reason, or another reason, why it's extremely significant, chose Orientalism as our entry point and heuristic. The significance of this is being played out right in front of our eyes with what's going on in Palestine, is because we have a correction and a very important correction to make when it comes to the I identity versus substance, okay? the identity of a thing or of a person versus the substance. What do I mean by that? I mean that, let's take for an example. We had somebody for, um, there was something going around on, on Twitter or social media 
that was, I think it was Mu'taz's uh, room or whatever. I'm, I'm technologically a Neanderthal. I don't know how it works with Twitter. It's like a space or a room or something like that. Somebody right. was putting themselves forward as someone from Gaza, and they were criticizing the Palestinian resistance, and they were putting the blame at the, that this that they work in uh, in U.S. intelligence or at least okay if we. And it's recording. The second reason for the next reason why it's extremely important and significant why halak UT versus substance. And what I mean by that is that the old Orientalism, the originally stated Orientalism, as we will see, of Sa'i, leaves us in a very weak position to withstand tokenization and a very weak position to withstand co-optation from different forces that merely find people within our ranks that will allow themselves to be internally colonized and espouse their own positions. For example, we saw in the past week Mu'taz, the, the Palestinian um, uh, journalist, had a, a Twitter space or something like that where there was someone that was putting themselves forth as being someone from Gaza. They were very, very harshly blaming the Palestinian resistance, putting the, the blame at their feet, saying this, that, and the third. It shortly came out later that he was deeply implicated in U.S. intelligence circles and might be uh, an asset to U.S. intelligence. So we see that your identity is not an inoculation. Your identity does not provide you with foolproof sanctity when it comes to the opinions that you espouse or the things that you stand for. That internal colonization is a real thing, right? How you can have the outward appearance or check all the boxes on the DEI um, initiative. But, but if the ideas and the discourse that you are espousing is compromised, then you are on the wrong side. You are actually furthering the work of modernity and of colonial secular modernity rather than doing anything else against it. This has happened time and time and time again. We have seen people who uh, critique sort of things from a, a, a liberal point of view or from a, the standpoint of liberalism. We see that there is a gulf between some, not all, but some of the pro-Palestinian activism, even of Palestinians in the diaspora, versus many of the Palestinians that are actually in Palestine. We see, you know, and this is not to cause division. We do not want division. We want sulh. We want ta'lif. We want to bring people together. But we have to have a frank conversation about these divisions, about the paradigms from which we speak and act, where they come from, which sorts of things are actually going to work in the service of liberation, and which things are actually just a further re-entrenching of colonial secular, secular modernity. That is what restating Orientalism and specifically Halak's decision to choose Orientalism as his heuristic forces us to deal with. And I can't think of a better time in history to deal with it than now. Because if we don't, and he criticizes in a loving sort of way, Saeed, for putting a band-aid on the issue in the sense that he leaves so much intact of colonial knowledge right, because of his own liberal, secular, humanist commitments, that it actually entrenched it and allowed it to live on life support for perhaps much longer than it would have originally made. Similarly, if we do not su sufficiently in this moment, in 2023, deal with these things when it comes to the issue of Palestine or the cause of Palestinian liberation, then we might also just simply put a Band-Aid on the things that are going on rather than deal with the, the very, very root of the issue and the structure, the structures of knowledge and action that produced the genocide in the first place. This was what Dr. Enes Tikriti said in his live stream with me on, uh, on Yaqeen Institute, when he said that it's not enough to call for a state, a Palestinian state. Some of our imaginations are so limited 
that we're all we're only calling for a Palestinian state, even if we call for one Palestinian state from the river to the sea. Why is this limited? That's not to say that it's an illegitimate demand. What it is is to say is that the state can be compromised. Look at the Egyptians. The Egyptians have a state. What good is it doing them? Right? The the Saudis have a state. There was recently a poll that was released. Sorry, I got some background noise here. One second. There was recently a poll that was released, I think, this week about Saudi uh, popular opinion. Oh, and yeah. the Saudi popular opinion is extremely in favor of the Palestinian resistance and has uh, and is very much at odds with what the government is doing. OK, um, you know, so um, this one, I lost my train of thought. Pardon me with, uh, with that noise. Um, it's just, simply having a Palestinian state is yes, no guarantee that it's going to be a, a state. Yes. And, and uh, with yes. the people, it could be autocratic, dictatorial, like you mentioned Egypt. Yes. The state is a technology, and Halak is trying, he's pleading with us to reckon with the fact that it is a very compromised technology, that it is a technology, and this is more impossible state than restating Orientalism, but it certainly carries through, that it is a technology that is built off of certain structures of knowledge, of certain ideas of nature, of certain ways of knowing, uh, that amalgamates power, that instrumentalizes reason and power in ways that result in genocide, that result in uh, in totalitarianism, right? That these are not accidental. These are not exceptions. These are not just simply mistakes. We, we, by yeah, we, yes. we saw. That. I'm sitting in France now. We saw that when when uh, France occupied Algeria in, in the early 19th century, and actually. It didn't just colonize it, it actually incorporated it into France itself. It was actually Department of France. It had its own MPs in Paris, of all things. But the, the way it the way it weaponized uh, liberal values of equality and civilization, civilizing the savages, those languages used in North Africa, uh, is a very good example of that. Because the values of liberty, equality, and fraternity, the values of the revolution itself in 1789, very much prized liberty fraternity, equality, who could object to those, you may say, but they were they were used to um, uh, basically uh, Europeanize, colonize uh, the, uh, North Africa and Algeria to such an extent to turn these Muslims into Europeans, into French people, basically. And this um, is a huge blind spot I mean, of all of those who argue for normalization. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to point this out. For all of those and Muslims who argue for normalization with Israel and argue for turning Israel into just one state that then has to force, it forces it to supposedly deal with its Palestinian population and deal with them in a South Africa sort of way or in a civil rights sort of way. This is extremely short-sighted and it completely neglects everything that you're talking about when it comes to the ideological component of this battle, how violently ideological the, the ideology of Zionism is the attempts of subject formation and brainwashing and colonization that are ongoing, that are, you can't even talk about the Nekba. Like, what makes you think that it's illegal to talk about the Nekba in the borders of Israel? What makes you think that putting everybody into one state as currently constituted is going to force Israel to have a, a civil rights-like discussion with the Palestinians that will eventually lead to their e equality in that state? I think this is extremely naive and extremely short-sighted and i challenge everybody who has grasped or held on to the normalization argument uh to wake up and to deal with some of these particular uh you know inevitabilities and these realities okay. Sorry, you, waking up now. you know four or five months ago people were falling asleep and ignoring the palestinian uh situation that is not the case now and the whole world is alert to it so it'd be interesting to see if uh the 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 movement back to the so-called abrahamic accords will can even take place anymore in in the opposition to their own populations in Saudi and Egypt and so on. I just can't yes. see how it's possible, but who knows? No, it, it must not. It not only shouldn't be possible, it can't be possible. We have to make it impossible. That is, I think, our charge as a Muslim Ummah right now, that, um, you know, it's a lot It's a lot less strong the Zionist entity and the entire globalist sort of liberal world order is a lot more fragile than people realize. And that now we are waking up to our power and we are able to, I think, now say that that appeasement, which was really just the um, providing a political and diplomatic cover for the appropriation and dispossession of Palestinians from their land and their own genocide, slowly, 
um, we can now throw it in the in the dustbin and say, no, we refuse to accept that. That would be disgrace. That would be treachery. That would be betrayal to our, our Palestinian brothers and sisters, and that we won't settle for such a weak alternative. The point in bringing this up about the identity versus substance argument, and it can go both ways, right? why identity is such a limiting thing is because some of the critiques, very, very few, but some of the critiques that were launched at impossible state were essentially boiled down to, well, is this what Muslims even think? Or do Muslims agree? And once you start to deal with the reality of the limiting nature of just fetishizing people's identities, right? Versus dealing with the substance of their constitution, right? And the paradigm from which they speak then that question becomes irrelevant. What must, like any, like every sort of structure of power has always conscripted people from the inside in order to do their work. This is even Quranic. Even Fir'aun himself conscripted Musa's first cousin, Qarun. Qarun was the first cousin of Musa that was responsible for being the overseer, the foreman, the one holding the whip to keep Bani Israel in line. This is the oldest trick in the book. If we only make it, and this is we're going to get into this more when we talk about Saeed's understanding of Orientalism, is just oh, it's people from the West talking about people from the East. Uh, we're going to um, fetishize people from the East to inoculate them from any critique of any possible internalized colonization that they might have undergone, right? And we're going to prevent the redemption of people on the West from becoming Muslim and steeping themselves and constituting them in the Islamic paradigm and actually coming to aid. Islam, just as the first converts of Islam aided Islam, no matter where they were from. So we do ourselves a disservice to limit ourselves to the identitarian politics of Saeed and those others like him in the liberal humanist camp. That do Muslims agree does not really matter. That what matters is what Islam says. What does the Sharia say? And are the Muslims properly calibrated and constituted according to what the Sharia calls for? There is a normativity, like you said earlier in the beginning. There is a there is an essence, and everyone must be judged and measured according to that essence. There is a normativity and a prescription for what people should be like, what relationships should be like, what society should be like, and we will not fetishize people's identities to save them from being critiqued if they are not matching up to the standards. And we'll do it with love, we'll do it with compassion and wisdom and all that stuff. Everybody knows we're not being harsh, but we will not not inoculate, and this happens in the academy and in the universities, where we attempt to insulate ourselves from critique by starting from our positionality. I am speaking as this, I am speaking as that, as a uh, as an Arab, as a woman, as a this, as a that. That does not inoculate you from critique because that identity that makes you up does not sufficiently describe what you are constituted by and the paradigm from which you speak think and act. And Halak refuses to let this point go and he forces us to deal with this point. And it ha as we stand on the precipice where activism is happening and much activism in the West that's pro-Palestine is of a secular nature, but we've seen a resurgence in, in Islamic and religious activism, this point has to be addressed. This point has to be understood by everybody that we have to judge ourselves and measure ourselves and evaluate ourselves from the Islamic paradigm. Orientalism, Halak says, is somewhat of a euphemism. Okay? It's it's a euphemism for the entire body of modern knowing or the whole way of modern knowing, the structure of modern knowledge. We get into ideas such as what constitutes the self, what constitutes the other in the first place, what is the relation between the two? And he has some important corrections for Said. Um, in this sort of relation, uh, this sort of relationship, one of his important corrections, just for example, is that they are not exclusively defined in terms of the other, right? This is something that plays into the Hegelian sort of uh, synthesis model. That well, we have to now have thesis, antithesis, synthesis, because each is just merely, only, totally, and uh, defined in terms of the other, and so we must transcend. Right and come out of it in order to be able to not be locked into this thing. No, it's not that simple. Right, there are many forces that 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 constitute the self of the West. There are many forces that constitute the self of the non-West or the rest, and it's more about re world recovery 
recovering the peripheral domains within you in order to shift things. It's not about destroying the, the self other sort of thing as Saeed articulated it. Again, we'll get into more details, but it's an important point. Hence, he says, Orientalism is a symptom of modern knowledge and the modern episteme. Orientalism is not a culprit or a cause in the way that Saeed made it seem. We do not just say that, oh, well, this is just Orientalism as if Orientalism is at fault for mere misrepresentation. We'll talk about that in a second. That Orientalism is simply a system of something much, much greater that it is a symptom of the entire modern way of knowing, the entire modern episteme, which he calls a psycho-epistemic disorder. Okay, can I just, just pause this? So, some may be thinking that this concept of Orientalism or, or modern ep episteme, modern knowledge, is it not being reified to an extent as a, as a, as a thing over against us, particularly if us is the rest of the world, the global south? But is it not the case that in the nature of modernity, I mean, to give a very uh, popular example, TikTok, for example, which is uh, a Papan is owned by the Chinese originally, so paradoxically, but um, nevertheless, it, it is part of many, many people's lives, be they in India or, or North, Af uh, North Africa or wherever. Uh, and, and so it's no longer um, a paradigm modernity or in the Orientalist world that is out there identified with the geographical area like the United States and Europe. It, it is as a transnational, transcultural phenomena that is inhabits our iPhones and we could be anywhere. We could be in Baghdad, we could be in Cairo, we could be in Washington, DC. So now that it permeates everything. It's not a discrete reified category that is over is out there. It is inside us, literally in our phones, in our rooms. And so is there not? Is it much more porous and and uh, uh, than this kind of, these kind of block categories might suggest? Certainly, and part of his corrective in introducing the domains, the central and peripheral domain, is going to help uh, elucidate that fact because even the he he says even the Enlightenment was not just one thing, even the Enlightenment was not a monolith. There were counter. Uh, rivulets, if we think of a stream or a river, there were counter rivulets in the Enlightenment, yeah. in Western society, in European society, even in just Western European, we're talking France, you know, uh, Holland, UK, right? There are multiple currents and counter currents. Really, what we're talking about is some of them, a few of them actually, became hegemonic. The particularly damaging ones became hegemonic. And the first thing that they have to do when they become hegemonic is they have to colonize the other counter streams that are local to it, okay, and subjugate them. Once the local alternatives are subjugated, then it turns outwards and continues to subjugate other ways of knowing and living throughout the world. So that's an important point. That also pushes back against just the simple identitarian, right? We're not leaving people with just, oh, you're just a white convert, Paul. You're just a, uh, you're just a, <laughs> You're just a, a British Muslim, right? And therefore, the only thing that you have to do is just, you know, I don't know, either there's nothing you can do, you're just always going to be a person of privilege, or uh, you have to move to Arabia and dress a certain way and whatever to be constituted. There are counter forces within the UK tradition, right? Within the English tradition, even we go super local within the English tradition itself. Right, there are counter traditions. So we'll talk about this in a, in a second. I think that's one of my last points for today about the imperative that this all leaves us with. What do we do? And um, this charge, it's related to what you're saying. Some people say, well, you guys um, take away the agency of the rest, the people who aren't Westerners by making the modernity seem like this thing that's only for Westerners and they impose it upon the world and then they're it's just perpetrators and victims, and that takes away agency. This is one of those critiques I can't stand that is very common in the in the academy. It's another one of those gotcha, gotcha sort of critiques. Um, Halak has such a beautiful response to this critique. He says, we refuse to conscript the victims of the subjugating violence into complicity with it and call it agency and call it agency. That you saying, according to your logic, 
that what would be agency is that, oh, people are also negotiating their own subjugation and they're resisting in like microwaves or they're taking it on themselves and producing a synthesis and they're reinventing it and they also have their own alternative modernities, hogwash. That's essentially what, what Halak says. There, we can not beat around the bush that there is a subjugation and a victimization that is going on here. It does not take away agency from the victims to call them victims. It does not. Because the agency is not found in their complicity with this violent project. No. Their agency is found in providing the fertile ground from which to critique it, first. And secondly, in providing the project of recovery, recovering alternative worlds and ways of knowing that are not genocidal and thus not modern. And this was, I think, for me, the, the big connect, which is why, you know, Halak was such a, a, an obvious sort of um, uh, kinsman, uh, intellectual kinsman of some sort, because my advisor, Himadi Mupadi of Vassar College, was always about recovering these worlds. That was something that we worked on extensively in undergrad. And so I didn't read Halak in undergrad. I'd only read him later. I read Esed a lot and others. But when he talked about this project, it was very, very familiar to me. I understand exactly what he's talking about is that these worlds have been subjugated. We're not going to settle for the wages of um, some sort of some sort of uh, side role or bit role, right, in the play of our own subjugation. That's what these people are, are arguing for who claim that this is agency, calling it agency. What, a, what an obscene thing to call it, right? No, we want something much greater than that. We're going to provide the fertile ground for the redemption from this violence. We're going to recover the world that is going to displace and replace this violent, genocidal, uh, hegemonic way of knowing and existing on the world. So you, you forced me to jump to that, but that's okay. But it's a really important point. Um, that moves us along to the intro, okay? Which I, I was going to end there with the end of the intro. That's that's one of the points that he ends on. <clears throat> he wants to he wants people to realize that it's not an accident if someone were to ask you what is Orientalism define Orientalism, it would be very hard to do. The average person, the average uh, university student, even post-grad, right? It would be very, very hard to do. That's not an accident. It's not an accident because the, the sense of what Orientalism is, taken from Said, who is obviously canonical, is very fuzzy. It's, a, it's very fuzzy. It's hard to actually pin down exactly what Orientalism is, exactly how it interacts with different ways of knowing, with the the colonial political projects with other sorts of things. That's not to say that Saeed is completely wrong. He said, Halak said that we stand on Saeed's shoulders. Saeed, like, basically what he says, and this is really important, I think, Saeed rendered visible something that before him was invisible. Right. Before Saeed, Orientalism was invisible. Hmm. It was so normalized and normative it was in the background and the ether of everything that people were saying, doing, writing, thinking, acting on non-Western spaces that you couldn't even describe it. It had, it was like a fish in water. They couldn't describe the water. So Saeed brought what was invisible because it was so hegemonic into the realm of the visible. Okay. However, his own limitations and his own constitution and his own commitment to secular humanism and liberalism prevented him from really drawing in granular detail what was Orientalism and how it worked and what was its relationship with other forms of power and domination and subjugation, okay? So okay, can I, go, can I, if we may, just a couple of sentences from the introduction uh, to, uh, there we are, Restating Orientalism and Critique of Modern Knowledge, um, where he talks about his relationship, uh, about how, of relationship with Said's book, Orientalism. Um, he says the book, Orientalism, uh, which of course, that's one, there are many different covers to it, that's my particular version, uh, remains uh, canonic, it's a canonical text. In other words, it's part of that received list of approved, and tried and tested works. Uh, but canonicity, says well, like, neither excludes the possibility of the work being transcended or supplanted, nor is it an eternal confirmation of the truth of its propositions. Side's work therefore provides me, says Rahalak, with the flair, though not the tools, to navigate my seas. This is a fantastic metaphor. If the metaphor is at all apt, I might say that in this work, I hijack Said's ship 
to re-equip it for the exploration of oceans that he could see dimly from afar, if at all. And that, that's, these are these systems of knowledge that you just mentioned before I read that quote. So this is one of the, the rare occasions where it actually becomes poetic. In his <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that was particularly well worded, mashallah. Um, okay, so very good. So, so if we're to render, what is the difference here? What's the shortcoming of Saeed's critique? And we'll get into it further as we get into the body of the text after the intro. But to summarize now, that Saeed's critique of Orientalism is very much based in positionality and identity in a way that has entrenched a sort of identity politics, especially on the left, uh, in political left versus the substance of what it actually is and how it actually works. So if we're talking about your position, like, like what is Orientalism and why is it bad? Okay, for the, for the layman. Like what's so, what is it, why is it bad? Is it just because Westerners are writing about the East, right? Would that imply then that you and I as people who were born and raised in the geographical and ideological West should never write anything or think anything or produce knowledge about the East, that would seem to be the conclusion, right? Or the consequence of if that is what Orientalism is. This is very problematic, um, Halak says, because it only leaves people uh, with two possibilities, okay? It unintentionally produces a situation in which if any Westerner, because they're guilty as writing about the East as a Westerner, not because of the substance of what they say or the paradigm from which they speak, but because of their, their identity. No matter what they say, it's wrong. Okay? If they are critiquing the East, and that was done a lot, then they are bigots. And if they are in support or admire the East, then they are exoticizers. And we've seen so those two terms exactly what uh, say uh, what well, Halak I mean uses in this book. Uh, that's exactly a quote you, you've got there. Yeah. Yes. So to critique the East as a Westerner makes you a bigot. How dare you? Mm. Right. To speak and to praise it is to make you an exoticizer. Oh, it's just this sort of thing. Exactly. Exactly. That exactly. doesn't mean that there isn't a descriptive power or reality to those two things. But Halak is saying that is there is way more specificity and substance to what's going on than simply that. And what's the unintended consequence of having this be the, the sort of grounds of our critique, the positionality or the identity of the person writing, of the author? One of the consequences of this, if he can't say anything or she can't say anything, positive or negative, is that the only thing they're allowed to say is that it's the same. And that too is an exercise of power. If they can't praise, it's Islam, for example, right? This is just romanticism. This is exotic. You're exoticizing the Muslims and they can't critique it. You're just being bigoted. You're being prejudiced. Then the only thing they're allowed to say is that you're just like us. Islam is just the same as Christianity. Islam is just the same as modernity. Islam is just the same as secularism. And that in and of itself is its own discursive violence, mm -hmm. right? You are now straight jacketing this thing that isn't yours and forcing it to be the same, when in fact there are significant differences. But you are not allowing the, dis the differences to be discussed or plumbed or talked about in any granular detail because you misplaced the site of critique by limiting it to the identity of the author. Okay? This is, as it turns out, this is a liberal value right? Sameness, right? To, to the Equality is sameness, right? This is something where it's like, oh, this is, that's why for some people it doesn't strike them as a bad thing, right? It's like, well, yeah, well, we're just the same at the end of the day. You get that, if you get that, that in France, for example, you know, the, the, the land of liberty, equality, uh, fraternity. So yes, you, you're free, of course, to believe in whatever religion you want, but uh, under, mm -hmm. underpinning this or overarching this is the sense that we are all, I, I don't include myself, I'm talking in the plurality we are all frenchmen frenchmen and women we, we are we have this shared collective identity as frenchmen and women i mean this is really stressed in in the last day because that means we're all the same actually so if there's any real difference there lurking in the in the the suburbs of paris for example uh, on these estates where many muslims live that is problematic and there's a real difference because they don't live up to this uh, idea of frenchness which is usually white christian or secular <laughs> so right. um 
it, there's this paradox here in, in, in the liberal uh, paradigm that it, it allows diversity, but actually is highly conformist to uh, a yes. particular configuration. Yes. And so it denies the possibility of stating, no, we are not the same. This thing, whatever it is, is very wrong. If I'm going to critique liberalism or I'm going to critique the West or whatever, it's like, I am not part of it. I do not agree with it. We, we are not the same, right? It prevents this type of critique because it goes against liberal values of equality and a environment where only sameness is accepted. And there is a type of discursive violence that is at play there. Um, oh, real? This Halak calls ideological. Yes. Sorry. So, or real violence. We, we we see violence against Muslims in in, yes. in France in, yeah. in the name of uh, you know that these people are different and they or they can be treated in ways which others uh, mm -hmm. would never be treated violently right. you know, by the police. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So it's discursive violence and it also authorizes uh, real violence. Um, yeah. Halak calls this ideological semantics. He calls it politicized sloganeering. Okay, um, he he poses a very provocative question. Says, why is it now become an insult to call someone an Orientalist, but it's not an insult to call someone an anthropologist? No, that's not right. Or an economist, or he gives a list of or an professionals. Yeah. Right. This, yeah. this is a, a brilliant point that Halak brings up to illustrate what Said has had done, or has done, or his critique, or the 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 nature of his critique has done for Orientalism. What they did was. Oh, it saved the entire structure of modern knowledge from real critique, right? By making it about your position, your identity from which you speak, by limiting it to Orientalism. Orientalism becomes a bad word. If you are jealous of your colleague and you think that he's full of, you know, you, you want his position, oh, you're just an Orientalist, right? But to call somebody an anthropologist is something praiseworthy. Call someone an economist something praiseworthy. Maybe not for me. I call an economist. It's not a praiseworthy thing for me. But, you know, he's pointing out that if Saeed's critique had been more structural mm. and more um, fundamental, then anthropologist would also become a bad word. Economist would also become a bad word. Because the knowledge structure of anthropology and economics and political science and orientalism they're all the same there are some differences they're not identical but the way in which they are structured the way in which they view nature the way in which they view the self and the other lead to genocide they were not merely they were not merely contemporary with genocide which they were this is the, 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 the shortcoming of edward said is that he was a secular humanist himself that he was part of the very much at home in the Western Academy, at Columbia, in fact, exactly the same university that Wallach, well, Halleck is, is uh, ironically, or not so ironically. Yes. So that, that's There's not an accident. Yeah. There is a, uh, a philosophical basis for that. Yeah. Yes. So Saeed's, is, Saeed's critique is political in, in, a, in a way where we're saying it's surface level. Okay. It's merely political. It's as opposed to an epistemic or a structural critique. It leaves untouched the modern subject, the categories of knowledge, the orientation and bearing towards the world, how nature is conceptualized, all these things. And that is because of, as we said, Saeed's liberalism, his secular humanism. Um, <clears throat> there is a bias that's underneath this, and we've I've talked about this in other places called the secular bias. Nice book on that, <clears throat> which perhaps we'll get through at some point uh, in the future you is the okay. myth you gave a of- Did you give a lecture on this a few days ago on YouTube? The secular bias, yeah. Yes, I just did this past weekend. Yeah. Yep, just this past weekend. The, yep, the secular bias, which is based off of, um, you know, the myth of religious violence by William T. Kavanaugh, right? The idea that religious people, there are more prone to violence, that they're, they're more prone to hate, that they're motivated or animated by hate and irrationality, that, um, as opposed to secular violence, which is always necessary and sometimes praiseworthy, that the secular violence is rational, it's limited, Right. This is this is an example of sort of the structural biases or the structural violence that's baked into uh, this way of knowing. OK, that's untouched by Saeed because of his own sort of secularity and commitment to secular humanism. So Saeed is something of a liberal reformer. OK, um, he scratches the surface. He scapegoats Orientalism. Uh, and unfortunately, even though we praise him for bringing into visibility things that were invisible before, 
he throws a lifeline to secular modernity's psychoepistemic disorder by providing the readily made scapegoat of Orientalism. <clears throat> modernity and its human subject, in fact, Halak says, modernity and its human subject, meaning the modern man, modern woman, cannot survive without colonialism and genocide in all their forms. So again, this is not just, they're not just contemporary. They're not just uh, uh, used instrumentally, right? It's not like that the colonizers, they're just colonizing and they're just using anthropology uh, instrumentally to achieve their aims. That this entire structure of knowledge, this whole way of knowing cannot survive without genocide and colonization. What would a substantial critique of Orientalism actually look like? This is going to set us up for the rest of the book. If we're not satisfied with Said's critique, critique, we're going to hijack his ship and we're going to take it um, to explore the seas uh, in a much more robust manner. Um, Said asks, oh, excuse me, uh, Halak asks, what were all the underlying forces of colonialism? Okay, Orientalism was not the only underlying force of colonialism. What were all of them? The author is only one force, only one part of the equation, only one site of critique. What are the other sites of critique that are beyond the positionality or the identity or even the intention of a particular author? Orientalism, he says, he describes it to illustrate the difference between the two, is not just a structured system, it is a systemic structure. This brings us back to the point that Orientalism is a microcosm. It shows, if you look into it, the entire structure of modern knowledge, right? And so therefore it is not Orientalism that is just to blame, it's our scapegoat, we found the, the bad guy. The entire thing is structured to know and to act just like Orientalism is structured to know and to act. And so we have to take Orientalism that say critique, we have to extend our critique horizontally, we have to extend it vertically, we have to extend it substantively and, tempor and temporally, right? So we're, whereas you can imagine the critique of Orientalism that Said wages is like a point on a graph, we're going to draw lines and take these things in different directions and in different dimensions. What is the relationship he poses between the author and the discourse that they inhabit or deploy and power, right? This is something that Said's critique of Orientalism doesn't really do justice to. It's just, you're a Westerner, you're writing about the East, Tough luck, sorry. You can't really say anything. How are knowledge and power independent, interdependent? We hear about this a lot. You know, and for those of you who have been patient with the jargon up until now, there's some unpacking that needs to be done when it comes to ways of knowing, uh, imperial ways of knowing, that the knowledge does violence. And this stuff is jargon for a lot of people, but it gets at something really important. Halak's gonna get into it. How does knowledge wield power? How does knowledge commit violence? That needs to be talked about in specificity. Um, as he says, as a as a almost like a an appetizer to, to tide you over until we get there into the meat of it, some knowledge doesn't kill. Some knowledge kills or demands that others be killed, and some knowledge doesn't kill. So if we can understand that, then which knowledge kills and which knowledge doesn't kill? Which knowledge calls for others to be killed or demands that others be killed? and which knowledge doesn't. So if we see here that Orientalism is not merely misrepresentation, it's not merely the bias of the author, it's not merely speaking about the East with a sense of superiority, even all of those, even though all of those things are true and happened, rather it is an act of world making. The structure of knowledge behind Orientalism and behind the entire modern way of knowing makes a world, okay? It, creates and structures and results in colonialism and genocide that is unique in human history. It is not like what came before, categorically, despite the variety. And Halak recognizes there's variety here. There's like out and out genocide, there's settler colonialism, and what he calls now remote control colonialism, which is a really nice phrase. There's variety there. But despite the variety, these things become a result of the structure of world making that Orientalism is just one microcosm of, the entire modern way of knowing and world making. Last few points to wrap up here, hour and a half is, is good. Um, let's see. So he responds, okay, well, we'll reiterate sort of the, the doubt, okay, and this is what, what you had brought up about other modernities, you know, 
there will be people that are too, I will say that they're too um, enraptured with the dunya. <clears throat> that will want to say, oh, the UAE has modernity. They have skyscrapers. Oh, India has uh, modernity. Oh, China has modernity. By saying that modernity is just a product of the West, then you are denying other people entrance into modernity, and therefore you are reifying this whole superiority, inferiority, center, periphery, binary. You are taking away their agency. You are um, basically doing discursive violence to them. And Halak addresses this. That this has a, first of all, a materialist bias and an economic bias to it. That there is something distinctive and unique and unprecedented about European violence. It is unlike anything that has happened before. It is not simply the case that if the Chinese had the, the guns and bombs that they would have done the same thing. Or if Muslims had the guns and bombs, they would have done the same thing. He goes, going to go into this more in a very, very thorough it's, way. It's, in the text getting sidetracked. But China clearly it doesn't, have, it doesn't appear to have any colonial ambitions globally. It's not like positioning its armies in Africa. America has bases all over the, the Middle East. Uh, and China, as far as I'm aware, has no bases, military bases anywhere in the Middle East. Uh, and yet, you know, is, is a huge you know, mini superpower in a way. So, yeah, it doesn't have that same right. kind of imperialist, colonialist uh, mindset that you're critiquing, arguably. Yes. <clears throat> Just as, as Norm Finkelstein had said, this is to confuse cause and effect. Okay, he said it in a different context, but it's a very, very useful critique. This is confusing cause and effect. It's not that European powers got the technologies and the technologies enabled them to conquer and colonize. It's that they desired to conquer and colonize through yeah. their particular ways of knowing and knowledge production. And that created the possibility to invent the technologies and the desire and will to go out and use them in the ways that they were used. That the, the, the types of slavery, Chattel slavery, right? The types of property, the corporation, we'll talk about it, were unprecedented that they were seen even if they had been, even if they had been imagined in earlier times, they would have been dismissed as immoral and world shattering. And they would not have been allowed to exist. And in fact, they were not allowed to exist. And so that's addressing one half of this idea of, well, you guys are just uh, reifying the West versus the rest sort of boundary that other people have modernity or et cetera. Like, no. This is something that is very particular to Europe, and that is not an embarrassment for the rest. That to share in this is not a good thing. To have dominated and colonized the world, to invented new forms of subjugation and oppression that nobody had ever seen before is not a feather in your cap, and you should not want a part in it. And it demonstrates something seriously sick inside yourself that you would want to take part in it and take credit for it. This thing is a psychoepistemic disorder, and it should be treated as such. And the last point, which we've said before, but for the sake of the flow of, of how the intro was originally written, we'll repeat it, that do not attempt, if this is addressing the agency doubt, well, you're just denying people agency, making everybody seem like victims, and that is colonizing them all over again. You know, that is discursive violence, et cetera, et cetera. People are active. Uh, resistors in their own colonization and victimization and stuff like that. Okay, granted, in some sense. But they are not agents, and we do not seek to be agents. We would abhor the possibility of being agents in this unique and unprecedented subjugation and domination of the world, that we would be afraid that we would be reprimanded and punished in the afterlife had we been conscripted successfully into this project. Rather, Halak says, that is, it's phony to call that agency, and it's an insult to call any sort of complicity in this project agency. Rather, where is the agency for the victims? And it's also an insult to not recognize the victimhood of the victims. Where the agency lies is in providing the ground for the critique of this subjugation in the first place. And secondly, 
in the imperative that naturally results in recovering other ways of knowing and being in the world that do not, not seek imperial domination over the entire globe. That that is where our agency rests, and that is a much more moral agency to be in possessive or to be in possession of than to somehow have played a role or had a hand in this colonial domination. And Allah knows best. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much. Yes, thank you much, very much. What you call the appetizer, very substantial appetizer, I must say. Um, we look forward to the meat <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> next time, inshallah, as you call it. Um, so, no, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've been talking, obviously, about this book, Restating Orientalism, a critique of modern knowledge. Um, there we go. And uh, I, 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 it's not an easy read, I must say. There is a certain w mode of expression which um, people who are academics uh, will be familiar with. It, it's, uh, but uh, once you get used to it, you can, you know, go with the flow, and it's readable, and he makes some very interesting points indeed. So um, do do get hold of a copy, and inshallah, we will discuss it further. Thank you very much, Iman Tom, for your your time, your enthusiasm, your commitment, uh, and your sheer intellectual power in bringing us these thoughts uh, to a much wider audience. So thank you very much. Until next time. <laughs>